Well, we're facing the next to the last week in our study of the book of Revelation. We are going to finish out the month of November, and I know that next week is election week, but we're going to have a class anyway. Okay, Revelation chapter 21. We're going to begin at verse 9, and we're going to go all the way to chapter 22, verse 5. Jesus had just given word to his apostles that he was going to die. And of course, you can imagine how they felt about that. They were sorrowful. And so Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. And if it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. So Jesus has gone to prepare a place for us. He's gone to prepare mansions for us in the Father's house. Now the Father's house is the new Jerusalem up there in heaven. The Father's house is where God resides. The Father's house is where Jesus Christ resides. The Father's house is where all the saints who have gone on before us are presently living. Now I recognize that God is an omnipresent God. God is everywhere at the same time. God is here with us tonight. God is in you and God is in all the space between us. But there is a place where God resides. There's a place where God lives. And that is in the new Jerusalem up in heaven. And Jesus has gone to prepare a place for us in the Father's house. So the good news is this, when we pass from this life, what does that mean? The angel of the Lord comes and removes our spirit from the body and carries our spirit right up to be with Jesus. And there's already a mansion prepared for us because God knows the very moment when we're gonna pass from this life. And so Jesus simply says to the angel, say, get that house prepared, get that mansion prepared because one of my children is coming home. Well, let's get into our text because someday we're going to be in the Father's house. Someday we're going to be dwelling in the new Jerusalem up in heaven. And so, uh, aren't you kind of curious as to what that place looks like? I mean, we all want to know where we're going to live and what that place is like. And so, Revelation chapter 21 into chapter 22 gives us some hints of that. So, notice first of all the showing of the holy city beginning at verse 9. You have the announcement by one of the angels. Then one of the angels who had the seven bowls filled with the seven last plagues came to me and talked with me saying, Come, I will show you the bride, the lamb's wife. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great high mountain and showed me the great city, the holy city, descending out of heaven from God. Now it may seem a bit strange that one of the angels that had the seven bowls of wrath is coming to John. And he's taking John to a high mountain and he is giving him a tour through the holy city, the new Jerusalem, which has come down out of heaven. And that holy city is a city prepared for the bride who is the lamb's wife. That's us. We are the bride of Christ. Jesus is our husband. And so it's a reference here to the church. It's where we are going to be residing. Now it says that John was carried away in the spirit, meaning that he's on some kind of spiritual journey. Now I have to admit to you that I've had some difficulty as we've gone through the book of Revelation trying to figure out just exactly where John is all the time as he's writing this book. I'm sure he wrote it on the Isle of Patmos, but there's so many different experiences that he has. For instance, you get over to the chapter one, and it says, I was taken by the Spirit on the Lord's day up into heaven. He's, uh, and and he's, right away, Jesus begins to talk to him. Jesus begins to introduce himself to him. And so it seems as though, right in chapter 1, that John has this out-of-body experience. That he has physically died. That his spirit has gone into the very presence of the Lord. 
and he is seeing firsthand exactly what's taking place. And remember when he's up there, he sees the Father seated on the throne. He sees the scroll in the right hand of the Father. And we also have that scene where somebody raises the question, who is worthy to take the scroll and open up the seals? And there was silence in heaven as though no one was worthy to do it. And what did John do? He started to cry. So he's up there in heaven, he's having this experience. And then there are other times when it seems as though he is there on the island of Patmos, maybe simply receiving visions or hearing messages from angels. And he's writing down exactly what he hears because the angels are certainly giving instruction to him. So here we see where this angel comes and carries him to a high mountain. Now I've been to the island of Patmos and it's a rocky mountain, but there are no high mountains. It's not a very big island at all there in the Aegean Sea. So I don't know where this high mountain is. But obviously it's something future because he's going to see the new Jerusalem descending out of heaven. And it's going to rest on that new earth that we talked about last week. Remember, this present earth is going to be burned up. The whole universe is going to be burned up. And it's going to be replaced with a new heaven and a new earth. And the new Jerusalem, which is in heaven now, where God dwells, is going to come down. It's going to descend and rest upon this new earth. Notice the appearance of God's glory there in verse 11. Having the glory of God, her light was like a most precious stone, like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. As crystal. So God is always manifesting his glory in terms of light. In heaven, the full expression of his glory is unlimited and unconfined. It will light up heaven and the holy city for all eternity. So God's presence is going to be in this new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven. It's going to light up the new Jerusalem. It's going to light up the new heaven. It's going to light up the new earth. And we're going to see later on there's no need of sun or moon. So God has always revealed his glory in terms of something that's brilliant, uh, the Shekinah glory as it's called. Remember, for example, in the book of uh, Genesis, we talk about God uh, walking in the garden with Adam and Eve. And uh, we'd have to believe that God there was uh, like a uh, glowing uh, cloud, a light that was in the presence of Adam and Eve. We see, for example, when the children of Israel were wandering around in the wilderness, they were led by a glowing pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. We see when uh, Moses had the temple built and later on when Solomon, or the tabernacle built and Solomon later on had the temple built. When both of those structures were dedicated, God's glory came in the form of a glowing cloud that rested over those buildings. Or we think of Moses. When Moses went up to receive the law, he came down and his face was so bright he had to put a veil over his face. The Bible says his face did shine. Well, he was in the presence of God and he was simply reflecting the glory of God by being in his presence. Or you think of Jesus there on the Mount of Transfiguration. The Bible says his face did shine like the sun. And so what we're learning now is when this new Jerusalem comes down out of heaven, God is dwelling there. That is his residence. That's where we are going to live for all eternity. And the place is going to be lit up by his glory. Now John also describes this light like a most precious stone, like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. Now, there's a problem here, and the problem is with the word jasper, a jasper stone. Because the stone here that is described is uh, translucent, so that light can go through it. But a jasper stone is opaque. And that's why some people believe that the stone really is a diamond. It is, it is something that is clear as crystal, that light can go through it. So, that's how the city is going to be lit. It's going to be lit by the glory of God 
And that light is going to be like a most precious stone, like a jasper stone. It's clear as crystal. It's kind of interesting if that stone really is a diamond stone because a diamond in a gold setting is appropriate for a bride on her wedding day, right? And remember how the New Jerusalem is described. It's prepared for the bride who is the Lamb's wife. Notice verses 12 through 17 where we have the size and structure of the holy city. Notice the gates of the city. Also she had a great and high wall with twelve gates and twelve angels at the gates. So, so kind of picture this now. Twelve gates, twelve angels each stationed at one of the gates. The names written on them which are the names of the twelve tribes of the children of Israel. Three gates on the east, three gates on the north, three gates on the south, three gates on the west. So before we explore the wall, I want to talk about the gates. And notice that there are names of the twelve tribes on each of the gates. Well, one name on each of the twelve gates. But the Bible does not tell us the names of the tribes that are written on the gates. Now we know the twelve tribes, but the problem is there are several listings of the names of the twelve tribes of Israel. But they're not always the same. You see, sometimes the tribe of Dan is not mentioned. Sometimes the tribe of Ephraim is not mentioned. Sometimes Joseph is a replacement. Sometimes the tribe of Levi is a replacement. There's always twelve tribes, but they're not always the same names. So, the problem is, what are the names on the gate? We don't know, because Scripture simply does not tell us. But what we are to learn from this is, in this new Jerusalem which comes down out of heaven, the Old Testament saints are present. Now we learn in verse 21 that the twelve gates were twelve pearls. Wow! One huge, huge pearl. You can see how big this pearl is going to be in just a bit. In fact, I'll tell you right now, it is 72 yards high. Can you imagine a pearl? Say, 216 feet high. Whoa! How do I know that? I'll tell you in just a bit. <laughs> Hang in there. Now, you wouldn't want one of those pearls hanging from your ears. I can assure you that, girls. <laughs> But you see, the pearl was a very valuable stone back in Jesus' day. Remember, Jesus told the parable of the merchant who wanted to obtain the pearl of great price. And he was willing to give everything he had to obtain this pearl of great price. And so there was no stone more coveted than the pearl. Now notice the walls of the city. The wall of the city had twelve foundations. Then he measured the wall, 144 cubits, according to the measure of a man, that is, of an angel. The construction of its wall was of jasper. Now notice this phrase here. This wall was 144 cubits in height. According to the measure of a man, that is, of an angel. Hmm. What does that say to me? It says that angels are about the size of human beings. We sometimes may, eh, maybe angels are 10 or 15, 20 feet. No, angels are about the size of a human being. Because we're measuring in cubits here, 144 cubits is the measure of a man, that is, of an angel. Now, how high was this wall? Well. If you uh, know what a cubit is, it goes, uh, it's the length from the elbow to the middle finger. So on an average, that's about 18 inches. So if you have uh, 144 cubits, that's 72 yards, or that's 216 feet. So that's why I say the pearl, if the pearl is as big as the wall, you can see that the wall is 216 feet high. That means the pearl is going to be 216 feet in diameter. Whoa, what a pearl and what a wall. Now notice also, well, let's, let's think about 72 yards for a moment. If you're, you're uh, get, get some perspective on this. You take a football field from... Uh, the playing field is 100 yards 
long. So, if you, if, you know, you, you, all you football fans out there. So we're talking about 72 yards. We're talking about just a little less than three quarters of a football field. That's how high this wall is. And again, it's made of jasper. And I have to go back and say the same thing I said before. Because this wall is obviously a translucent wall where light can come through it. Jasper is an opaque stone. And so we might think of this wall more like a diamond or something that shines like crystal. Interesting, we have a, a crystal chandelier in our uh, dining room. And in the morning when the sun comes in, the sun reflects off the crystal, rainbows all over the wall. And it's just beautiful, you know, and our grandkids when they're there and spending their life, they all gotta see the crystals, you know, and the, and the, and the rainbows. And so that's kind of the picture I'm getting here. Maybe the, the, the light of God is reflecting on this wall and it's, it's just covered with rainbows reflecting everywhere. Can you get the picture? Notice the foundation of the city. This begins at verse 19. The foundation of the walls of the city were adorned with all kinds of precious stones. The first was jasper. Again, we're going to say that's a diamond or a clear stone. Kind of imagine this in your mind as we go through this, because we're going to see multicolors here on the foundation. The second, the second foundation was sapphire, that's blue. The third was chalcedony, that's a sky blue with stripes of other colors in it. Then the fourth layer was emerald, that's green. The fifth, sardon, uh, sardonyx, that's a red and, and a white mixture stone. Then you have the sixth, which is sardius, that's red. The seventh is crystallite, that's a transparent gold. The eighth is beryl, that's a sea green. The ninth is topaz, that's a transparent yellowish green color. The tenth is crystophase, that's a green stone. And then you have the eleventh, which is uh, jacinth, that's violet. And the twelfth stone is ameth amethyst, and that's a purple stone. So, you can just imagine all these multicolored stones stacked on top of one another. And I believe they're right out of the open. It's not a foundation that's buried in the ground. It's something that we can see, all the beauty of the foundation. And then on top of that foundation is this 72-foot high wall of diamond with the light shining through it. It's crystal-like. Get the picture. Man, don't you want to be there? <laughs> now, on each of the stones, you have the uh, names of the 12 apostles. And this, again, creates a problem because there are 12 apostles, but which 12 are mentioned? See? I mean, we, we know 11 of them right away. Is Judas mentioned? Probably not. Well, then Matthias is the one who took the place of Judas. Is he mentioned? How about Paul? I believe Paul's name was there, not Matthias, but... That's just a personal opinion, and if you think Matthias' name is there, that's okay too. But you have 12 uh, layers of foundation of multicolor, then this wall. It's uh, a beautiful picture. But what does all of this represent? Remember the gates. That's the Old Testament saints. The foundation stones. That's all the New Testament saints. Who is it that is going to live in this new Jerusalem that comes down out of heaven? All of the saints of God from the Old Testament to the New Testament times. Now notice the dimensions of the city. Beginning at verse 15. And he who walked with me had a gold reed to measure the city, its gates and its wall. So here's this angel. He has this reed and he's going to measure things now. The city is laid out as a square. Its length is as great as its breadth. And he measured the city with a reed, 12,000 furlongs. Its length, breadth, and height are equal. So this is the city four square. That's where the four square church gets its name. Okay? So it comes from the city of Jerusalem, which is a city four square. All sides are equal. So it's a 1,500 mile cube. So, 1,500 miles wide, 1,500 miles long, 1,500 miles high. Okay, question. If this is going to come down out of heaven, is it going to be placed where Jerusalem is today, or do 
where where what is? Where Jerusalem is today. No, this is no, this is a no. This is a this is going to be on top of the earth, of a new earth. We talked about a new heaven and a new earth last week. And so the, the new Jerusalem comes down and rests on that new earth. It was a totally different earth than what we have today. And we don't know what that is because we don't know what it would look like. No. No. Now, here's the question. Think of all the people of all history that are going to be in the new Jerusalem. Is this city big enough to hold everybody? That becomes our question. Dr. Henry Morris, a young earth scientist and theologian, writes this. This kind of geometry makes it easier to understand how all the redeemed of the ages could be living in a cube city. Although there's no way of precisely knowing how many people will be there, one can make a somewhat accurate guess. It can be calculated. Of the total number of people who have lived between Adam's time and our time is about 40 billion. Then assume a similar number will be born during the millennium because of the conditions and allowing another 20 billion who died before or soon after birth and never really uh, populated the earth, it is reasonable to assume that a hundred billion men, women, and children could have been members of the human race past, present, and future. Now understand, he's going back about 7,000 years. That would be Dr. Morris's position because he's a young earth uh, scientist. He's passed away now. We go on. The Lord Jesus made it clear that the vast majority will never be saved. Right? If this figure is used, then the New Jerusalem would have to accommodate 20 billion res residents. Also assume that 25% of the city is used for dwelling places of the inhabitants with the rest allocated for streets, parks, public buildings, and so forth. Now get this. The average space assigned to each person would be 1 over 30 cubic miles. This would correspond to a cubic block with about 75 acres on each face. That is a cube of space, 75 acres high, long, and wide. Now, we live in Orange County. There isn't anybody in this room that has 75 acres in Orange County. And we're talking about 75 acres cubed, 75 acres long, 75 acres wide, 75 acres high. That's how much property you are going to have in the New Jerusalem. You think this place is going to be crowded? Can you, can you imagine all that? I mean, all of us, you know, we'd like a little space. And more and more, it's getting crowded here. My wife really complains about that. And I think you'd, you, know, you have to go on the freeway every day, and thankfully I don't have to do that anymore. Uh, there's another way of calculating this. Dr. F.W. Boren, an Australian theologian, writes this. Now, if you work it out, you have an acre of, uh, an area, rather, of 2,250,000 square miles. That is 15,000 times as big as the city of London. So... That's how large this new Jerusalem is. So let's just picture 1,500 mile cube, for example. Take the distance from Miami, Florida to the tip of Maine. That's about 1,500 miles. The length of every street would be one-fifth the diameter of the earth. So you would have millions of golden miles going in all directions. What we're getting at is this. There's simply plenty of room in the New Jerusalem for everybody who is saved. And you don't have to feel crowded. And you don't have to get upset when the city planners start building more apartment buildings nearby. Only to create more traffic. We have that problem in Huntington Beach. Now remember too, remember too, that we have glorified bodies. Not the body that we have now. We have glorified bodies. So, how are we going to travel around in this 75-acre cube? Woo! We're not going to need cars. We're not going to need airplanes. We're not going to need buses. Having a glorified body means we can will ourselves to be anywhere we want to be because we're going to have a body like the resurrected body of Christ. Remember, 
Jesus in his resurrected form walked right through a closed door. Remember, Jesus in his resurrected form appeared to the two men on the road to Emmaus. He's just, he's there, and then he's gone. And so we can just whoop, there and we can be whoop, gone, see? <laughs> so we'll have all this area to move around in. Here's what John says. I read this to you last week, but it's important. Beloved, now are we children of God, and it's not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him. That's, that's the point I'm making here. For we shall see him as he is, and everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. So we shall be like Christ in his resurrected form. What Christ was able to do in his resurrected body, we will be able to do in our resurrected body. Notice the beauty of the city. And the city was pure gold, like clear glass. And the streets of the city was pure gold, like transparent glass. So can you imagine, I mean, this city is sparkling with gold, but it, it's transparent, and, and the light is shining through it, and it's just brilliant. Now, I've given a quote here from Josephus. Josephus was a Jew. He also was a Roman historian, but he was a Jewish historian as well. And he's describing Herod's temple in the days of Jesus. Now, remember, Herod's temple was really Zerubbabel's temple. But by the time uh, the Roman Empire took over and Herod's in charge, I mean, the temple of Zerubbabel that we talked about when we were studying the book of Zechariah, uh, that, that temple was in shambles. It needed repair work. And so Herod is going to make that his temple. He's going to restore it. He's going to enlarge it. He's going to beautify it. And remember, there was that time when the disciples were there at the temple, and they're just marveling at the beauty. And what did Jesus say? You know, this temple, it may be beautiful now, but it's not going to be long until you're not going to see one stone upon another because it's going to become desolate. But here's how Joseph, uh, Joseph, Josephus describes the temple. Now, the outward face of the temple in its front lacked nothing that was likely to surprise men's minds or their eyes, for it was covered all over with plates of gold of great weight and at the first rising of the sun reflected back a very fiery splendor and made those who forced themselves to look upon it to turn away their eyes just as they would at the sun's own rays. But this temple appeared to strangers when they were at a distance like a mountain covered with snow. For as to those parts that were not golden, they were exceeding white. So what he's saying is this. As Herod is, is redecorating the temple, rebuilding it, restoring it. He's putting these huge plates of gold on the temple. And when the sun would come up and reflect off that gold, it would blind people's eyes. And so when people were at a distance, the temple was so white, it looked like a snow-capped mountain to people. Because it was up on a mountain. And you could see all this white from a distance. So, here's what I want you to see. The, the New Jerusalem, the New Jerusalem is going to just flash brilliant gold. But we're going to have redeemed eyes. We're going to have glorified eyes. I won't have glasses. You won't have to have sunglasses. You'll have perfect vision. And, and the brilliance of the city is not going to be something that you have to turn your eyes away from because it's something that you're going to be able to behold and marvel and say, wow, <laughs> isn't that something else? Notice next the spirituality of the holy city. We're going to begin at verse 22. As to the place of worship, and I saw no temple in it, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. So there's no temple now in the new Jerusalem that comes down out of heaven. But it seems as though there was a temple in the present heaven. Now I know there are those commentators who say no, that when the word temple is mentioned, it simply refers to the throne of God. But I don't know that I believe that. Here's why I don't. Remember there's a passage in Revelation where John is in heaven and the door of the temple is open. And he's able to look all the way back through the temple 
to the Ark of the Covenant in the Holy of Holies. And out of the Holy of Holies comes seven angels. And then you have one of those uh, uh, living creatures, one of the four living creatures, handing to each of those seven angels the seven golden bowls of wrath. So John is actually able to look into the temple and see the Ark of the Covenant and see these angels come out of the temple. And then you have the altar of incense. Remember we talked about that. How those martyrs are praying under the altar of incense. How long, O Lord, before you bring vengeance upon us from those who have shed our blood. So there's a temple in heaven today, it seems like. But when the new Jerusalem comes down out of heaven, there is no temple. That means that this city dwells within the temple, which is the very presence of God and Christ. God and Jesus are the temple in this new Jerusalem. Notice verse 23. As to the presence of the Lord is light. The city had no need of sun or of moon to shine in it, for the glory of God illuminated it. The Lamb is its light. Well, I think that's pretty self-explanatory. We've already talked about the Shekinah glory of God glowing throughout the city, lighting up the new Jerusalem, lighting up the new earth, lighting up the new heavens. And we don't have any sun, we don't have any moon, there's no need of it. So notice verses 24 through 26, as to the purpose of all things. And the nations of those who are saved shall walk in its light, and the kings of the earth bring their glory and honor into it. Its gate shall not be shut at all by day. There shall be no night there. And they shall bring the glory and the honor of the nations into it. Now I know there are some who see this as a verse that refers to the millennium. Why? Because it's talking about nations being present. It's talking about kings of the earth being present. And so, hey, this verse must refer to the millennium. No, I don't think so. I don't think we're going to go backwards here because we're in the context of describing the new Jerusalem which comes down out of heaven. So who are these people then or these nations? Well, the word that is translated nations is actually a word for peoples or ethnic groups. Here's what's interesting. I never quite thought of it like this before. Maybe you haven't either. Up in heaven there's going to be a lot of different races of people and they're going to look different than we are. There's going to be Japanese people up there. There's going to be Chinese people up there. There's going to be people from Africa up there. There's going to be Caucasian people up there. There's going to be people from Chile and Peru up there. Brazil. And Brazil. Yeah, we got a Brazil here. Listen, there's not going to be any racism in heaven. And we're all going to get along. And we, not, and we may not even be the same color or look alike. Don't get the idea that everybody up in heaven is suddenly going to be blue-eyed and white-skinned. Now notice also the kings of the earth. Who are the kings? Well, I, I would think that over, over history, there are those kings who have given their life to Christ. And so there are going to be kings living in the New Jerusalem. The problem is they're not going to be kings in the same way in which they were kings here on earth. Everybody is on the same level. There's no one ranked above another. There's no race of people superior to another race of people. All racism is eliminated. All social stratas are eliminated as the former rulers of the earth give up their glory and everyone gives total glory to God. That's what the new Jerusalem will be like. Amen. Notice this verse also tells us the gates shall not at all be shut by day. And there's not going to be any night there. So these big 72 yard high gates are going to be open all the time. There's going to be an angel standing at each of these gates, but they're going to be open. Why are the gates open? So we can get out. But we're going to do something that uh, a lot of people desire to do, but I wouldn't want to do it now. You know, some people want to go to Mars. 
And so there are people that have paid $250,000 to sign up and they're going to go to Mars. The problem is there's no promise of getting back. <laughs> yeah. So they got a one-way trip to Mars. And all that sand and all that rock, you know, and goodness. I don't know what they're going to eat up there. I'm not going to worry about that because I'm not going to put 250000 What? Mars bars. Oh, Mars bars. <laughs> they have some Mars bars. <laughs> okay. Well, they might get that too. Here's what I think. God created a new heaven and a new earth. And there are going to be other planets out there. Different planets than what we have today. And we're going to say, hey, I want to take a vacation. And the gates are open. And I'm just going to will myself to go to this planet over here and I'm going to spend some time enjoying the beauty of the heavens. Or I want to explore the new earth. And then I'm going to come right back to my home again. People think heaven is boring. Let me tell you something. We're going to travel like you have never, never heard of or thought of before. We're going to go places that science hasn't even dreamed of yet. Furthermore, there's not going to be any sleeping in heaven. <laughs> Listen. We're, we're going to be energizer bunnies, you know? And, and we're always going to go all the time. Well, there's not going to be any nighttime there. <laughs> now, notice Richard Baxter is a Puritan writer, wrote of, of the rest. Now, we are going to rest. There's a difference between going to bed and sleeping and just deciding, I'm just going to sit down and have a good rest. I'm just going to relax. That's maybe a better word. He says, Oh, blessed rest. Where we shall never rest day or night, crying, Holy, 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 Lord God of Sabbaths. When we rest from sin, but not from worship. Rest from suffering and sorrow, but not from comfort. O oh, blessed day when I shall rest with God. When I shall rest in knowing, loving, rejoicing, and praising. When my perfect soul and body together shall in these perfect things perfectly enjoy the most perfect rest. When God also, who is love itself, shall perfectly love me, yes, and the rest in his love to me as I rest in my love to him and rejoice over me with joy and singing as I rejoice over him. So, heaven is going to be a place of relaxation. It's going to be, a, I mean, there are times probably we're just going to lay under a palm tree and say, hey, man, this feels good. I don't know if it's going to be palm trees up there, but yeah, yeah I'm just trying to. It's not all business. It's not all travel. We're going to see that we are going to serve God, and we are going to be ruling and reigning. And what that means, well, I don't know, but we'll talk about it in just a bit. So there are things we're going to be doing in heaven, and the point that we're making here is heaven is not going to be boring. Notice the purity of all things, verse 27. But there shall be no means enter it, anything that defiles or causes an abomination or a lie, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. So while these gates are open, and while we have access to leave the new Jerusalem and travel where we want to travel, John has assured us that nothing defiling, nothing abominable will enter the city. Only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life will get there. Okay, we're going to start in chapter 22, and we're going to look at the uh, first three verses. Actually, we're going to look at the first five verses, but we're going to start with the first three of them. Let's talk about the supplies of the holy city. In uh, verse 1 of chapter 22, you have the source of the river of life. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal proceeding from the throne of God and the Lamb. Remember, there's no sea in the New Jerusalem. We talked about that. But there is a river. It's called the River of Life, and it flows from the uh, throne of God through the heart of the city. Now, water has a lot of symbolism in Scripture. Water symbolizes salvation. It symbolizes eternal life. It symbolizes being born again. It symbolizes satisfaction with Christ. 
Remember, Jesus said, whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst, but the water that I shall give him shall come in him a well of water, springing up to eternal life. Again, he said, if any man is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scriptures have said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. The psalmist said, there is a river, the streams of which make glad the city of God. So, get the picture. Flowing through the heart of the new Jerusalem, from the temple of God, or, uh, sorry, the throne of God. No temple there, throne is the river of life. Now, notice the staples from the tree of life. It says, in the middle of the street and on either side of the river was the tree of life, which bore twelve fruits, each tree yielding its fruit every month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. Now, literally, a text should read like this. In the middle of the path of the river, on both sides of the river, is the tree of life. So, I want to get the picture now. Here's the throne of God. Here's the river of life. In the middle of the river, if you're going to, if you're going to read the text literally, in the middle of the river is the tree of life. The branches reach out on both sides of the river. So people walking on this side, they can grab some of the fruit. They can grab some of the leaves. On the other side, they can do exactly the same thing. So, the tree of life is, uh, well, where did we first meet that? In the Garden of Eden, right? And Adam and Eve were allowed to partake of the tree of life prior to their sin. And that's what gave them eternal life. But once they committed sin, what happened? They had to be removed from the garden. And an angel had to protect the garden so they could not get back in because they could not partake anymore of the fruit of the tree of life. Now, they had been cursed. So this tree bore 12 different fruits. Doesn't tell us what. Maybe some apples, maybe some pears. I don't know what. But 12 different fruits. A different fruit each month and its leaves were for the healing of the nations. What I find interesting is there's no time in heaven. And yet now it talks about months. So, so obviously we're, we're using kind of language that we can better understand because there is periodically a, a period of, uh, there's no time, but uh, how else can you express it? Uh, this particular month there's this kind of fruit. And a little time later there's uh, another kind of fruit. It's, there's no time that we don't grow old. That's the, that's the real reason. Isn't that, isn't that comforting? Anyway. Notice, different fruit each month, and its leaves were for the healing of the nation. Now, that, again, is a strange phrase, because there's not any sickness in heaven. So why do we need the leaves to eat if there's no sickness? Because it says it's for the healing of the nations. So I had a little struggle with this. But the word healing gives us the word, uh, our, our word therapeutic. So it does not imply illness, but seems to imply that the leaves are meant to give you an extra boost in life, to provide an extra dose of energy, so you can keep running like that uh, Energizer Bunny. Energizer bunny. <laughs> yeah. Does that uh, have a scripture reference to Ezekiel 47, chapter 47? Because that says all the fruit will be renewed every month. Yeah. And then, oh, that you're talking about. Eating. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, we did talk about that in the book of Ezekiel, and you're right. Did you pull that out of your head, or did you remember that from the teaching? If you remember that from the teaching, you get a star. <laughs> okay. Anyway, the fruit is for eating. So, you know what? We're going to eat in heaven. And the leaves are like vitamin pills. And both are to add to the enjoyment of heaven. Now, it's interesting to see how the phrase tree of life is used in Scripture. And it's all found in the uh, book of Proverbs. Notice this. Wisdom is a tree of life. The fruit of righteousness is a tree of life. Desire fulfilled is a tree of life. The soothing tongue is a tree of life. Oh my God. So, when we partake from the tree of life, it not only gives us eternal life with more zest and vigor, it gives us wisdom. It gives us righteousness. It gives us fulfilled desires. It gives us a tongue that blesses. Notice the secret of its effectiveness. And there shall be no more curse, 
but the throne of God and the Lamb shall be in it. So no more curse. Well, we go back to Revelation 21, verse 3, where we were last week. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. No more curse. Well, let's bring this to a close. We'll look at verses 3 through 5, and that's the servants of the holy city. Verse 3 of Revelation 22 is the plan to serve God, and his servants shall serve him. So we are his bond servants, and we're going to serve him. Now, I can just hear the question, what are we going to do? I don't know. So don't ask that question. You'll get the same answer. I have no clue what we're going to do. We're going to do whatever God asks us to do. That's what we're going to do. Polish the wall. Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> Polish the wall, okay. <laughs> yeah. Can you imagine that, uh, that Christ Cathedral, that crystal cathedral, that, that, you know, all the glass in that thing? They're spending more money on refurbishing that place than they did, they paid for it in the first place. <coughs> 74 million to refurbish it and 53 million to buy it. All the glass there that needs to be cleaned every once in a while. That'd be quite a cleaning bill, wouldn't it? So we're going to serve him, but you know, whatever we do, uh, it's going to bring us joy and it's going to please God as well. Notice the promise of God to his servants they shall see his face. Whoa! You know, in Exodus 33, 20, God told Moses, You cannot see my face, for no man shall see me and live. John writes, No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father, he has declared him. Paul wrote, He who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings, whom no man has seen or can see, to whom be honor and everlasting power. Amen. Amen. So, in heaven, things are going to be different. That is, in the new Jerusalem. Now, I don't know. When we go to the present heaven, which is not the new Jerusalem come down out of heaven, but the present heaven, I know we'll see Jesus. Will we see God the Father? I don't know. It doesn't tell us. But what we do know is this. When the new Jerusalem comes down out of heaven, we will see his face. Yes. Okay. Is this a name? No, that's it. Somebody, it's a ruler. Ruler. Yeah. 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 Somebody with a little potency. <laughs> Remember, Jesus said this, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Notice the possession of God as his servants. And his name shall be on their foreheads. Now, we saw this expression before over in chapter 14, verse 1. Remember the 144,000 Jewish evangelists? They're standing on Mount Zion with Jesus, and they had the name of God written on their foreheads. And I said then, I don't literally think God is tattooing his name on their foreheads any more than he's literally going to tattoo his name on our foreheads. It's just an opinion. I think what it's saying is this. It's an expression of ownership. We belong to God. We are part of his family. We are totally secure in the heavenly home. We belong to God forever and ever. Amen. Hallelujah. We don't have to worry about anything. He is going to totally protect us. But in reality, there is nothing he has to protect us from. Because everybody up there is beautiful, lovely. And they are all saints. Notice the position of reigning with God as his servants. There shall be no night there. Well, we've heard that. There's no need of lamp or light of the sun, for the Lord God gives them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. So the key phrase I want us to look at here is, and they shall reign forever and ever. So we're going to serve God. I don't know what that means. I don't know what we're going to do. We're just going to do whatever he asks, but we're also going to reign with him. And I'm just as confused about that. Over what are we going to reign? Over what are we going to have authority? Because I believe everybody is going to be equal up there. 
Yeah. What? I want to be part of the choir. You want to be part of the choir? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Can I come and hear you sing? And I'm going to play the piano. I've never played the piano in my life, but I'm going to get to that. I'm going to play the piano. And I'll, I'll sing a duet with you, too, because I'm going to have a wonderful voice. You know, I, I just I tried to do some thinking about this raining, and I'm wondering, are there going to be animals in heaven? Yeah, OK. So if there's animals in heaven, maybe we're going to take care of the animals in the sense that we're going to reign over them. You know, we have to have dominion over the creation here, so maybe we'll have dominion over God's creation. It's just a thought. I don't know. Well, there's a lot of landscape to take care of. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but you know what? There's not going to be any weeds to pull. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, 75 yards. Anyway, here's what I'm saying. Heaven is going to be a wonderful, wonderful place. I mean, don't get the idea that you're going to be bored because the average Joe out there in the street, you know how they describe heaven? We're going to be floating on a cloud. We're going to be strumming a harp and we're going to be just singing all these praises to God and that just sounds so boring to me. No, that's not going to be the case. We're going to be, uh, there's going to be responsibilities that we have. There will be leadership to provide. There will be worship to lift us up. There will be food to eat. There will be time for rest. And above all, heaven will be the place and the time when we will behold the face of God, which has heretofore been only seen by His Son, Jesus Christ, and His angels who move in and around the throne. So right now, right now today, Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father in the present heaven, not the, not the one that's come down out of that, hasn't happened yet. And you know what? He knows the moment you're going to pass from this life. I, I believe, you know, the book of Hebrews says it's appointed unto man once to die and then the judgment. The word appointed in the Greek, interesting word, it means a reservation. It means, that means that you have a reservation to meet God. It's like God has this big book up, up in heaven, and, and your name is written there under a certain month of a certain day, of a certain hour, of a certain minute, of a certain millisecond. And when that millisecond comes, the angel comes and removes your spirit and takes it to be home with the Lord. You have a reservation. Now, some of you are going to go out to a restaurant this week, maybe. Maybe you're going to make reservations at the restaurant. You're going to call the restaurant and say, hey, there's going to be five of us coming. We're going to be there at 7 o'clock for dinner. And so you go to the restaurant. There might be a big line of people who didn't make reservations. But you can walk right in. There's a seat prepared for you because you reserved. Now, here's the difference. You knew what time you were coming. And the restaurant knew what time you were to be there. But only God knows when it's time for you to meet him. He has made the reservations. You just don't know what time it is. Can this reservation change? Pardon? Can these appointments can be changed by God? Can the appointments be changed? Well, God can do whatever he wants, but the Bible says he doesn't change his mind, see? So, though you do have some expressions in, in Scripture where, but you see, God is an omniscient God, and he knows exactly the game you're trying to play with him. So, go ahead. Okay, I've got a question. If that river is flowing, where does it go? <laughs> Since there's no sea, no. where does it go? Well, it just wraps around the new... <laughs> yeah, yeah, probably. God is a conservationist. <laughs> And he keeps using the same water over and over again. <laughs> okay. I just want you to know, Jesus is up there in heaven, seated at the right hand. And when your time comes, when my time comes, he's already said to the angel, I know when it's going to happen, get that mansion made. And whoop, your house is ready. And you're going to be in eternity, and you're going to live with him forever and ever and ever and ever. And you're going to come down with him in this new Jerusalem. It's going to be exciting. I'll see you there. Okay. <laughs>